Right, good morning, my name is Tom Smythe and uh, I am on the faculty at USC Aiken in the School of Education. And I primarily work with the uh, program for the Master of Education in Education and Technology, which is jointly offered by um, USC, Columbia, and Aiken. That happens to be a, an online program. So over the last decade or so, we have explored many different ways to deliver the program, to deliver it effectively, to make certain that we are, in fact, offering um, high quality instruction. So we have students from all over the uh, state and beyond. And um, uh, I would say it's a really good program. I'm certainly biased, but I see a couple of our graduates in the audience uh, online, and that's good, too, and also some former faculty. So at any rate, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm here to talk a bit about the so-called flipped classroom, and I'll stop calling it so-called now, okay? Um, it is sort of a nickname for a way to uh, potentially improve instruction and more specifically to increase um, student engagement and learning, which um, are recognized as two keys to um, uh, retention of students and graduation rates and all those wonderful things that um, we look for um, in a successful university. So um, let's start out by looking at the uh, some questions that I would like to address today. And uh, feel free to type in uh, your comments or questions in the chat. And I'll pause periodically and um, ad address those, either at the end or um, sometime during the presentation. OK, so um, what is the flipped classroom? And uh, why should I try it? What does the research tell us about the flipped classroom, and uh, how can I do it? So very straightforward here, uh, four questions that um, we'll talk about today. A very basic definition of the flipped classroom, um, and many of you are familiar with this already. It's certainly been popularized through the, uh, through the popular press, as well as um, in academic literature as well, more and more. But essentially, students gain the necessary knowledge, the facts, maybe some of the skills, before they come to class. And then in the classroom, the instructor guides students to actively and interactively clarify and apply that knowledge during class. And I'm reading this quite deliberately because there are some key terms there about what happens in the classroom, namely that students are active. They're interactive, collaborating, and they are applying their knowledge. OK? Um, so that's a basic definition. Um, another way of looking at it is that um, you know, the homework is really uh, you know, out of class materials are what happens in class. That's the flipping part of it, namely that what you would expect students you know, traditionally to do at home, they're doing um, in class. Um, and the other way around, if you use the lecture model in your uh, courses, at least some portion of it, one way to do that is to deliver the lecture, record it, and allow students to look at it, view it at home um, before class. Okay, And then they come to class where they'll be uh, engaged in some sort of activities. So the homework can be things like uh, self-recorded video lectures, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, or screencasts. Um, it can be a set of links, you know, curated links in the sense that you are guiding them to look at specific information before they come to class, or even looking at a variety of uh, uh, OER, or open educational resources that are available for, uh, for instruction, okay? And Notice, again, in class, active project-based learning. That PBL is uh, not just very popular, but it's uh, supported by much practice and research and theory. That is, uh, students are engaged in authentic activities, applying their learning, learning at higher levels. OK? So I think that's pretty straightforward, but I want to make sure everyone's on the same page here as far as um, what we're talking about with the flipped classroom. Um, another way of looking at it, it's a mixture of um, direct instruction and constructivism. 
Um, direct instruction being the explicit teaching of a skill set using, say, lectures or demonstrations. Okay? Nothing wrong with that at all. It's the way it's traditionally been done in the classroom since, well, after Aristotle and Socrates, but um, for a long time, Greeks and Romans, and since then, and certainly in our traditional universities. That is the way instruction is delivered. There's nothing wrong with that, assuming you know, students are, in fact, engaged and, and excited about what they're learning in class. So the question that sort of the flipped classroom is addressing is, how can we get students more engaged when they're in the classroom? Do we want them to watch a lecture for 50 minutes while sitting in a classroom? Or are there ways that they can be more um, engaged? So direct instruction is very popular these days, especially with standards and all that. Um, but there certainly is a balance um, between the two. It's not really a dichotomy, but you can use both of these, direct instruction and constructivism, in your instruction. Constructivism, uh, one definition of that, humans generate knowledge and meaning from an interaction between their experiences and their ideas. Um, when I saw the term constructivism, and you, certain names probably come to your mind, uh, certainly uh, John Dewey, uh, you know, learning by doing, etc., cetera, um, and uh, some of uh, Jean Piaget's work as well. So um, there's certainly plenty of theory to back it up. So again, looking at the flipped classroom, the traditional classroom, the teacher instructs, the students take notes very obediently. The students follow some guided instruction, perhaps. The teacher gives an assessment. The students have homework. What's wrong with that picture? Nothing. It's OK. <laughs> if that is your strength as an instructor or instructors you're working with, that is their strength, is, is lecturing. And they find that they're getting the proper amount, they feel, of engagement with students. Um, that's perfectly OK. And maybe there's some courses or subject areas that lend themselves more to that traditional instruction. But what we're finding, I think, if I can generalize, is that the new student, that is a student of the last decade or so and current ones, are like to be more engaged. They need a little more stimulation. They're much better at multitasking, if you will. Um, so with the flipped classroom, what happens? Again, the teacher instructs the lesson through a video or a podcast or, you know, a book. Go home and read a book and we'll come and talk about it. Well, that sounds traditional and that's okay. That's one way of doing it as long as we're guiding them in their reading or looking at website. So the teacher instructs the lesson in effect at home. That is, the student views the video. And then the students come and work in class. So I've sort of beat that to death. I know you understand what the flipped classroom is. Uh, again, look at the traditional classroom. What happens? The students arrive, you know, get settled. You review the homework. Then there are 45 minutes or so of lecture on new content. And then maybe some independent learning, OK? Nothing wrong with that, really. But there might be a better way to engage students. And that is, again, they arrive, get settled. 10 minutes, talk about you know, what you did for homework, what the, the video you viewed. Um, there are ways to guide them in their, their response to that as well. And then 55 minutes of guided and independent and cooperative learning. In other words, they're much more uh, participatory. One more way of looking at it, and I know this is pretty straightforward, but uh, before class in the traditional model, what do they do? Well, they might have some homework, but let's say nothing. Then during class, what do they do? They watch the lecture given by the professor. They go in and watch the professor, and as I mentioned, take notes. And then after class, somehow consolidate their understanding through activities. So in the flipped classroom, again, they do their reading. They watch their lecture prior to class. Then in class, a range of activities, and we'll, we'll focus in on those in, in a few minutes, but uh, through discussions, even quizzes, maybe group quizzes, having them work together. Um, again, it's led by the professor, but the students are, in a sense, in charge of their own learning. And then after class, further consolidation of learning. So 
that's sort of what is the flipped classroom, and it's, you certainly understand that. So uh, why should I try it? Or not, okay? And there are plenty of allowances for for not, and I'll I'll speak to that in a minute. But um, why should I try it? Well, there is uh, limited research, but most agree that group work leads to livelier discussions. Okay. In other words, students are more active participants in their learning. Uh, what's more, they gain exposure, as I mentioned first, and process the information second. It forces students to synthesize the information, apply it, and that information can be from text, from lecture, and or discussion, or all three. Okay? Have you ever talked to a professor or had the problem that, you know, I, assign, I made that reading assignment, but the they just won't do the reading. They come to class, and what happens? They aren't, you know, about half of them have read it. Well, this is one way to uh, help them become more responsible for their, uh, their own learning, you know, to be accountable when they come to class. Uh, so, why else should I try it? It makes learning the focus rather than teaching. What does that mean? Well, in the lecture model, you know, it's sort of teacher-focused. The teacher is the center of attention. Think how the classroom's laid out, all the chairs facing the teacher. Again, we allow for that being okay. But I'm suggesting in the flipped classroom, there's a different approach. It's more focused on the learner, on the student. Uh, it encourages independent learning. It enforces accountability, as I mentioned. Um, in class, it allows for uh, more individual assistance. Okay? Um, in other words, the instructor can work one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, students can work with each other. A lot of peer instruction going on. There's just so much power in that. Um, and then, of course, it enhances critical thinking. And you see our dear friend Benjamin Bloom's name written there. And uh, you all know about Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, I think this is the so-called old one. There's a new one, I think, came out in 1991, something like that. But it's, it's okay. Look at the traditional model matched up with Bloom's. You know, the, the uh, sort of literal levels, remembering, understanding. That's in the traditional model, the teacher introduces the material, the teacher lectures. Then students do their homework, supposedly on these levels of understanding, creating, evaluating, analyzing. But in the flip model, um, the new material is introduced to students, but outside of class again, and then they come to class where they can work together, really creating and evaluating and analyzing and bouncing ideas off each other. Um, I mean, it just has so much power if you're so inclined to do that. Again, there are a lot of other factors. Um, notice it maximizes use of class time. Now, there are some who are going to say, well, my lecture is more important than students talking to each other. They can do that outside of class somehow, and they do it anyway. Um, but think about that valuable class time. What's the best way to use that? Is it for you to lecture for 50 minutes, or is it maybe a combination of the two, or having students uh, engaged in the, in the subject matter and the topic. Okay? Uh, also, the ability to adjust instruction styles on a per student basis. We hear a lot about differentiation of instruction, and um, the flipped classroom lends itself to that in the sense that the instructor can work one on one with students, at addressing questions, um, perhaps guiding them to different levels. Um, and ultimately, we see better student performance and grades in the limited research that we'll look at uh, in a moment, some of that. Okay? So these are all reasons why I should try it, you know, if you're so inclined, if your subject matter lends itself to that, um, if, in fact, um, uh, you're so inclined. So, why should I not try it? Okay? And uh, it does require careful preparation in terms of putting together lectures, um, designing the lectures so that you know one may view it via uh, a video or a podcast or some other way, 
Um, and I believe it requires a commitment and a belief in, in its effectiveness. That is, if you're going to do it, I mean, believe in it. Try it out. Be willing. Be open to, uh, you know, the possibilities of perhaps not teaching the way you've always taught. Um, and that's, that could be considered a pretty strong statement, but it is, um, I think it's accurate. Um, it's also easy to get it wrong, you know. I think it's good to start simple, maybe with one lesson. Flip it. Okay? And see how that works. Do one lesson at a time. Be selective. It's quite scalable, by the way. I mean, you can do a whole class, flip a whole class, or you can flip, you know, one lesson or one unit or however, one module. Uh, and we're thinking in terms, I hope I made this clear, of primarily a hybrid environment, not so much totally online, but a hybrid meaning uh, partly in the class and partly uh, uh, online in some form. So, I mean, perhaps you teach a fully face-to-face -face class. Again, you can flip that just as easily. Um, another downside, I guess, students have to adjust to the model. Um, in many cases, you know, students are slow to, uh, to change. It makes them uncomfortable, just like everyone can be resistant to change. And um, it's worth explaining, you know, why you were doing this, why the class uh, is being designed a little differently, um, and also what the expectations are for the student. And then the third bullet there, equity of access, that, that's a very real problem which some have, have tried to offer solutions to, but um, if you're going to provide a lecture for students to view um, online, they have to have online access, okay? And some students don't, in fact, have internet into the home. So you might say, well, put it on DVD. Well, you've got 30 students, you're going to burn 30 DVDs or 20 or how many ever need it. Um, one idea, use a thumb drive. They're relatively cheap. You could give that to the student. Some might say, oh, they can go to the li public library. All libraries offer um, access. Well, if you've ever been in a public library with computers, uh, even in a city, there might be 20 or 30. They are being used actively. Okay, by, by many people from the community. So um, that is something to be aware of, making certain that your students have access. Even if you say, well, you know, on campus you have a computer lab you can go to. That also can be challenging. So I think it's worth being aware of the equity access issue. So those are some reasons why you should try it, and perhaps why not, or at least why you should be careful when you uh, when you do, be aware of some of the issues. So what does the research tell us about um, the flipped classroom? Well, it is limited because it is a relatively new uh, uh, concept or idea defined as the flipped classroom. I think we've done variations of it for years, okay? But as far as the the, the pure, if you will, flipped classroom. There, there is limited research, but there is an established body of research that supports the key elements of the model, okay? Such as active learning, okay? The tremendous amount of the effectiveness of students being actively engaged. Um, and also the idea of um, peer instruction. Um, with active learning, students are um, doing things, they're thinking about things they're doing, okay, as opposed to being a passive learner where they're sitting in a class listening to a lecture, okay? And uh, with peer instruction, um, Eric Mazur, who uh, was, or I think he still is at Harvard, is a leading researcher on peer instruction. And essentially what happens, the student becomes the teacher in effect. And those of you who are, who are educators know that Teaching a subject is one of the best ways to learn it thoroughly, to think about it deeply. So when peers are instructing each other, um, they're not only helping someone else learn, they're learning uh, themselves, okay? Um, so again, the, the flip learning model facilitates this one-on-one uh, -on -one attention, peer instruction between peers, um, and so. What does the research tell us? Well, the Center for Digital Education did a survey of higher education faculty in 2013. Um, it was about a little more than 300 faculty, so yes, it was a limited uh, uh, sample. 
Um, but what they found is that the shift of the instructional model from a passive one to an active one um, helped, among other things, to, uh, to prepare students for careers in the sense that they were working collaboratively. Okay? They were engaged in deep thinking. Um, they assumed some autonomy and independent responsibility for their learning. Wonderful skills that prepare students for the real world, okay? Um, among faculty, 83% uh, you see the model has positively, positively affected their attitudes toward teaching. In other words, they get much more excited about their teaching. One, it's something different. I'm not going in and giving the same lecture year after year, or even if I switch it out. I'm doing something a little different. And more importantly, I'm engaging with my students. I'm getting to know them. I'm able to share my knowledge, but you know, in a very personal way, as, as Cindy Jennings spoke to in the previous um, presentation. Um, I'm not skipping over that, but the 75% found that preparing for a flipped classroom does take more time than a traditional class. Um, and I think there's, you know, we should recognize that. Sort of like preparing for an online instruction, it does take more time but I think the rewards are, uh, are worth it. Okay, so uh, looking more at the research, uh, this was a large lecture physics course at the University of British Columbia. Uh, this study, uh, this example, shows that attendance increased by 20%, engagement increased by 40% as measured by an instrument they used in the study, that's student engagement. And uh, students stated that uh, attitudinally they enjoyed the interactivity. 90% said they uh, did enjoy it. Then looking at an introductory calculus class at, uh, in Ann Arbor, um, at home the instructor guided students through calculus exercises. Okay, he, he did a, like using Camtasia or a screen, some other screen recorder, showed students how to go through the process of solving the problems, okay, the exercises. And then in class, students work with peers to present and discuss their solutions. And the findings in that, and again, they had a control and experimental group. Students in the flip course made gains at twice the rate of the control group, gains being uh, measured by uh, the, the tests they used in each core, in each uh, uh, sample group, okay? so. I mean, I think that's pretty valuable. It is limited, but uh, it does tell us that there is some good positive research out there. Um, I have a, a bibliography, a, a list of references that I'll show you the link for, and um, you can look at some of the other research if, you'll, uh, if you care to. There are also some, uh, there's one meta-analysis of it as well. So the biggest challenges they found, the Center for Digital Education, um, need for professional development. Faculty do need the assistance on understanding the whole design of, of instruction in the flipped classroom. And also, of course, some of the technical things that we've heard about over the last three days. You know, how to do screen recordings, how to share that with students. Um, and then there's the whole issue of time to create the course content. Uh, we're fortunate here at my institution, USC Aiken, that we are um, we have very good support from the administration for um, exploring alternative um, instructional practices, such as online instruction. Okay, and then uh, next, how can I do it? Okay. And what we'll do is look at some of the steps one might follow um, in flipping the classroom. First of all, as you understand by you know, the definition of the flipped classroom, uh, provide an opportunity for students to gain their first exposure to content prior to class. This can be through textbook reading, standard way, guiding them through that, lecture videos, podcasts, or screencasts. Um, you can post your, and some of this is low tech and some sort of high tech, but even, even the so-called high tech is not insurmountable. It's pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. 
Um, but you can post your YouTube, your uh, your video, your screencast, or the video of you lecturing if you'd like to be the talking head. Uh, not the best way, but you could is to uh, post it on your own channel on YouTube. Okay. Um, you can grab lectures from places like Khan Academy or MIT OpenCourseWare. These are free. These are open educational resources that you can use. You find someone else has done a good lecture, you can take a snippet of that or the entire thing and include it as part of your course. Again, you can post it on YouTube or somewhere else, TeacherTube, um, or you can you know, embed it in Blackboard. You can now embed, embed uh, YouTube videos in Blackboard or Desire to Learn or whatever you happen to be using at your institution. Um, Coursera is one of the uh, you know, for-profit inst online institutions. But you can grab stuff from there. Um, the Open University um, has amazing uh, resources. But uh, I have a link to this for you. But uh, here is a YouTube page of uh, Dr. Talbert. Um, who is a uh, mathematics instructor. I forget exactly where. Um, but this is at the Open University. I guess he does that through there, I believe. I'm not sure. But here are some of his vid videos. This is his personal channel. Anyone can set up his, his or her own channel on YouTube. And there you can post your, um, your video um, and just give a link for students to go to it, or you can embed it in your, you know, wiki page or web page for your class or your uh, learning management system such as Blackboard. Another wonderful source is um, iTunes U. Um, notice in the center here for the classroom, materials by subject. Um, they're just amazing resources here, all of them free, which you can incorporate in your courses, okay? You can use them as part of the so-called outside of class work, okay, in the flipped classroom, if you find a good, a good resource. Let's look closely at this um, for the classroom, materials by subject. Notice it's listed by subject, about any subject you can think of. Now, some of these are K-12, but some are also appropriate for higher ed, okay? So I recommend that. So again, looking at how can I do it, low-tech and high-tech solutions. Um, things like Screencast-O-Matic or uh, Camtasia or Gene, which is now, they don't have a pro version of Gene, so you're, you know, you're limited to less than five minutes. But Camtasia, which is relatively inexpensive, um, will permit you to uh, uh, you know, do screen recording. We're going to hear a lot more about that at the 11 o'clock hour, so I hope you will stay tuned for that um, for the next session on Camtasia. It is an amazing and easy to use tool for uh, creating, you know, developing lectures and all other kinds of things, so which we're going to hear about. And then there's something called Office Mix, which is relatively new, but it's a uh, plug in for. Uh, the Windows version of PowerPoint, uh, whatever the latest version of that is, and uh, it allows you to record, again, do a talking head kind of stuff and bed quizzes, all kinds of stuff. And uh, then you know about Adobe Presenter and many other um, possibilities, okay, but these are uh, a few of them, which I recommend investigating. Um, after you use it once, you'll, you'll find they are just incredibly um, easy to use and effective. Um, so what do you do with the video once you create it and you've posted it? Do you just say, go look at the video and then come to class? Um, that's one way to do it. But uh, on many of these, in many of these tools, you're permitted to uh, embed questions along the way. Okay? In other words, you're guiding students as they're watching the video to pause and answer questions. Um, you could embed a Google form to um, respond to the video. The power of that is, one, students are going to attend to it and, and learn something, but it also keeps them accountable. Again, back to that, they don't read the text before they come to class, and it makes class awful. Well, this encourages them, in fact, requires them to, in fact, read the material um, and respond to it 
so they could have a like an entry ticket when they come to class. You know, I've done this. Turn hand it in or you know, put it online or whatever it happens to be. Okay? I'm gonna pause there to do just a quick um uh, technical check, so hang on a second. What about it? Okay, uh, when, uh, when I want to ask that I repeat what I said about Google for using Google Forms. Um, it's just such a simple tool to use to create, as you know, a survey or a list of questions, short questions, and you can ask students to respond to that um, as or following the video that they're watching at home, the video lecture or whatever activity you have for them to do before class, and then they'll respond to the form, and of course it plugs it into a little spreadsheet on Google Drive, and you've got all their responses there. You can look at it before they come. You can make them accountable, you know, so that everyone has responded. Um, do you give points for it? That's totally up to you. It's probably a good idea, you know, to, to again, add to the accountability and maybe motivation, if you will. Okay? So that was, uh, you know, how can I do it? And you want to provide an opportunity for students to gain their first exposure to content prior to class. Okay, that's just... The definition of the flipped classroom. So provide an incentive for students to prepare for class and that's just what we were talking about. Um, you know doing a Google form, uh, provide an advanced organizer. Um, I did my dissertation research on advanced organizers and pre-reading activities um, more decades ago than I care to admit but it is still, I mean so I can tell you it's a valuable tool using advanced organizers and uh, uh, there are many ways to to apply those but again it guides the student as they're watching the lecture or listening to the podcast or whatever else they're doing um, in understanding so that the basics so that then when they come to class they can think and work at a higher level okay so um, how else can I do it? I can, you need to provide a mechanism to assess student understanding. And again, these types of pre-activities, such as advanced organizers, can be useful. Um, you can even, again, as I mentioned, have students pause the video to solve a problem or predict an outcome, or for them to write a question to bring to class. You know, I watched this, and this is one question I had, and everyone brings in their question. It gets discussion going once you're in class. Um, and that can be used as a, essentially a departure point for individual discussion and assistance, whether it's in peer groups or one-on-one -on -one with the instructor. Now, we're in class. What do we do? We provide in-class activities that focus on higher-level cognitive activities. Okay, in other words, we spend class time to promote deeper learning and deeper thinking about the material. Okay, and we do that through peer interaction, through interaction between the professor and our instructor and individual students. Um, it depends on the discipline as what's going to happen in class, okay, the subject area, but uh, it might be a debate. It could be some sort of data analysis, you know, an applied activity, um, applied experiments, say in the sciences, um, or other kinds of synthesis activities, maybe mathematics, it could be problem sets that students work on together, okay, in pairs or in groups, so that uh, the professor is there to address uh, issues and problems and to elaborate as needed. Perhaps you as the instructor see that there's a pattern of difficulty that maybe your lecture didn't really cover Okay, so that when you're in the classroom, you're seeing this pattern, then you can speak to the whole class or to groups that are struggling with that. So it's pretty straightforward, obviously. But in class, students use time to understand and increase their skills using their new knowledge. And I'm not sure if you can see that clearly, can you? This is uh, another sort of scheme of uh, Bloom's taxonomy. And if you look at the so-called bottom levels, um, remembering and understanding, 
This is sort of what's happening during the lecture, okay, at home. And then they come to class applying, creating, evaluating, analyzing. And as we look at some of the terminology used there, design, build, construct, under creating, plan, produce, devise, invent, higher level thinking going on, evaluating, judge, test, critique, defend, criticize, say through debate or, and through discussion, and analyzing, uh, comparing, contrasting, organizing, all that stuff. Okay, so you get the idea is that in class, they're using so-called higher level thinking skills, also known as deep thinking, which I have problems with those two terminologies because one's higher level and one's deep thinking, so but you sort of get the idea. All right, and so in summary, how can I do it? Identify where the flipped classroom model makes the most sense in your course. Okay, again, it's especially applicable in hybrid courses, that is, that have some online component and some in class. Um, but it works in almost any uh, class in which there is some face to face uh, component. You could probably make an argument it could work in an entirely online class too, uh, where the discussion takes place in a discussion board. Um, asynchronously or, um, you know, live through using a variety of tools um, synchronously. So again, spend class time engaging students in the application activities uh, with feedback. And then adapt your materials for students to acquire course content in preparation for class. In other words, through a podcast or video or however you plan to do it outside class. And then the last one that is quite important, and that is to extend learning beyond class through individual and collaborative practice. That is, it doesn't just end in class, um, whatever the topic is. Students will have further ways to uh, encounter and analyze and work with the um, topic, whatever it happens to be. Um, so again, I recommend that if you're interested in, in the flipped classroom and uh, trying some variation of it beyond what you do already, um, uh, to start slowly, you know, keep it simple. It is very scalable. Uh, you might try it with one lesson and then um, add others later. Um, or, you know, do it for a week. Whatever works for you. But I, I do highly recommend it. Acknowledging it's not for everyone, but it, is, uh, it has proven to be valuable for student en engagement and uh, learning. So a flipped class keeps student learning at the center of the instructional process. Everything we're reading these days, everything we understand about instructional design and effective instruction uh, says that the student learning is at the center. Okay? That's the goal. And really, like the best classes have always done, this approach supports instructors playing their most important role, which is guiding students to deeper thinking and to higher levels of application. So I think there's a lot of power there because it improves student engagement and it improves learning outcomes. Okay? The flipped classroom does challenge the traditional pedagogy or conventional pedagogy, if you will, but uh, I do hope you will try it. Here is a quotation, again, from the Center for Digital Learn Education Survey. And I'll just read that to you if I may. Students enjoy coming to class a lot more since I started flipping my classroom. They perform better, they retain more knowledge, and they're more engaged during class. This was a music professor who was in the study. So try it out. Here's a URL to locate any uh, materials that uh, we have here, which are primarily a uh, list of references and this particular presentation. So I'm going to pause there, Veronica. All right, let me uh, connect to that and um, actually do it here.
Okay, the question is, oops, what is a good way to explain the student expectations of the class and how the class works? Some students do not think you're teaching. That's a very good point. <laughs> yes, right. Well, um, that is a challenge. And, and the reason I laugh is because, yes, many students and many faculty think you aren't teaching unless you are lecturing. In other words, you're the sage on the stage instead of the guy on the side. You're, you know, the information dispenser versus the uh, facilitator. I mean, we've been, you know, reading about this for years now, and it's challenging that not everyone has, uh, has gotten on board with that. Again, it's a function of maybe the instructor's personality and strengths. Um, you might say, well, maybe the subject matter doesn't lend itself to being the guide on the side. But I, I think you could argue, on the other hand, that every subject can, can lends itself to um, maybe not the flipped classroom per se, but certainly uh, a teacher. Uh, how did you put it? Uh, not teaching. Well, you are teaching. It's just a different approach. So a good way to explain student expectations. I think to be very frank with them. I mean, make sure you understand the, uh, you know, the project-based model and authentic assessment and authentic activities and, um, you know, explain that there are different roles for an instructor. And, uh, you know, we are, you can talk about teach a man to fish, you know. All that I mean, there are many, many different varieties of explaining it to students, and I have no doubt they will understand, and in fact, enjoy it a lot more. You're putting the burden, if you will, it's more the responsibility for learning on the student. It's always been there, but I think it's more apparent in this case that the student and herself is responsible for their learning. They're much more participatory. Um, so I hope that begins to um, address that question. Um, okay. Uh, Cindy mentioned a tool for, uh, you saw that, for um, hosting a video, uh, around a video, good. I think that discussion around video, good. And anything else, Veronica, that you see there? Good. Okay. All right. Well, I will pause there and say thank you, all of you, for being patient and uh, participating. And please, uh, I would love to engage in conversation with you as well about the flipped classroom or anything related to that. Again, do take a look at that URL if you care to uh, grab this presentation, which um, actually was in keynote form as well as uh, PowerPoint and then a, a PDF of the uh